Okay, thank you guys for coming. <clears throat> Every year the crowd gets a little bigger. Um, this is, I think this is the big, I think this is the largest crowd we've had so far. Next year, next year we may have to find a new venue. I love it. Uh, my name's Josh Frost. I am the president of Labor Fest Hawaii. Thank you guys for coming. Um, before we start, I want to thank all of our co-sponsors who helped uh, make this evening possible. Uh, the AQ, uh, AQ McElrath Fund. Uh, Hawaii AFL-CIO, Hawaii Peace and Justice, HSTA, IBEW-1260, ILW-142 uh, Musicians, Associ uh, Musicians Association for hosting, um, IASTE-665, uh, Unite Here Local 5, uh, Gottlieb Law, Olelo, and Pride at Work. Um, I also want to introduce the Labor Fest board. Uh, so I'm, again, my name is Josh Frost, I'm the president. Uh, Amy Peruso is on the board. Please stand up when your name is called. I know she's here somewhere or not. Amy's left the building. Uh, Tim Zhu, Benton Rodden, Noel Kent, Ray Catania, and uh, last but definitely not least, Leslie Lopez, uh, who actually does all of the work for Labor Fest. And without her, we would be, uh, we would be nowhere. I'd also like to thank Yes. Okay, so up first we have for our spoken word poetry, we have Darren Cambra, who is a member of HSTA, and following him will be Tui Scanlon, who is the VP of IATSE. So, there. Thank you, thank you. As, a, as an educator, I really, I've, as an educator who has taught as, at public, private, and charter schools, I really appreciate what unions do to protect their workers. I've done many jobs in my existence. I've changed diapers for dependent adults who couldn't fend for themselves worse yet. I've taken crap from bosses, bellowing orders about duties they don't know how to do. I've played the part of professional puppet, putting on neckties, keeping clean cut for a few bucks over minimum wage. I've catered to tourists and car dealers. I've felt as thankless as day labor and as hated as a telemarketer. I've been a substitute in public education institutes trying to keep bored students astute with old text and bland worksheets. But there's no job I find more rewarding than when I see youth speak and I help teens seek their writer's voice. I am a poet mentor. Two words fused to wield welded word weapons using hurt to heal. Picking and prodding, finding layers to peel. Truth and lies wrapped in lines molded from angst and jubilation, celebration and frustration when you can smile and cry at the same time, when the thoughts in the back of your mind are mainlined to your core, when you look at something you wrote down and you finally figure it out, that's what poetry's for. I want to see eyes surprised when self-guise is stripped, a connection from hearts to lips spoken from pages. I want to spill how I feel like the leaks from Katrina's levees could be compacted into composition books, when your mental canal dredges up dreads and dead dreams like the Alawai after 40 straight days of rain, when it all floods your brain, the inner voice goes insane, and you strength to contain the veins from bursting at your wrist because you are so pissed, or so infatuated you lose common sense. I want to be that spark. Lighting the brain fart that blows down the wall to writer's block. <laughs> because silence is only deadly to your dreams. The thought strings in between our commas are so common they weave universal truths sewn by elders and youths into garments. To pad the shoulders of an adolescent atlas and a retired Zeus. I want to highlight forgotten fringes to show the world how far humanity can really stretch. Because I know I can't breach the boundaries alone. And that's why I teach. I try not to preach, but I just want to reach them but I'd rather call it facilitate because I want them to innovate, not just imitate and regurgitate. Yes, I demonstrate, but not and duplicate. I want them to really even create no restraint. I want writers to find their own voice, make their own choice, keep their pages moist with ink, tears, and sweat, scripting sarcasm and scribing regret, soothe the scars that stuck me in a shell of a guy too shy, too tall, or just too proud to find a shoulder to cry on. I wrote poetry before I knew how to slam. When I was a cocky, yet handsome punk, just tall enough to dunk, this is who I am. 
It's not a character I play on stage. I've used my pages as God, sending bloody letters to God and getting no response. So my first audience is myself. But I compete for the person who doesn't really like poetry, who gets dragged to a slam by a date and can't wait for it to end. Because if that person found one little line that made them think, something to drop their jaw or their drink, then I've done my job. Because I share for the soul that's scared of self-reflection. That kid that feels alone in a crowded room. For anyone that's been bullied or ignored, had their hearts opened or broken, lost innocence or loved ones, is for anyone who has had words stuck in their throat. I'm not a role model. I'm a model with rolls. <laughs> that rolls of karmic punches that leaves skid marks on the high road I cross paths with pupils. Passing on poetic passion, praying and prying with a pen and paper, I'm never going to be a perfect person. I find too much beauty and faults and too many lessons and mistakes to ever want to change the past to who I am, a poet and a mentor. Thank you. Please keep your applause going for Tui. Good evening. My name's Tui Scanlon, AKA Too Easy, your friendly neighborhood Samoan at your service. I'm the vice president of IATSE Local 665, the union behind entertainment. Just got off of one crazy wild gig and uh, happy to be here tonight. Uh, we are not necessarily going to see all the benefits that, of the fight that we're, we're fighting, but for me, it's all about planting seeds for trees and shade I may, I may never see, and that's okay with me. So uh, I wrote this uh, when I was looking forward to becoming a father, before I even had a real shot at it, I guess. And uh, <laughs> this is a true story. I totally got in trouble with my teacher for, uh, for mopping off and sassing, so here you go. This is called Legacy. I remember being asked, as all children are at that age, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of all the cacophony of vocations, astronaut, firefighter, cowboy, doctor, the only thing that made sense was the one that probably didn't make any dollars. I said I wanted to be a good father, but I didn't want to be an astronaut because I was taught that I didn't have to leave to succeed, that I could climb to any height so long as I kept my feet on the ground, my head in the clouds, and my sights and my principles. Didn't want to be a firefighter. Passion already blazed inside a frame, too young of age to accept its power. Besides, I'm probably going to spend a lifetime extinguishing my demons anyway. We were already cowboys. Our Wild West days were just beginning, trying to hijack a living from bandits in three-piece suits. I may not be a doctor, but I was given all the surgical instruments I would need to heal broken hearts, stitch up old wounds, and mend rifts between siblings. The teacher smiled. That is so adorable, but I don't think you understood the question. And chalking it up to childhood ignorance, walked up to the chalkboard and wrote, what job? Double underline, do you want? I grunted. Mine's the most important job I've heard all day, and what the hell does my job have to do with what I want to be? She jolted, surprised at the thunderclouds beneath my eyebrows and the venom in my voice. She had no choice but to put me on timeout to think about what I'd done. Well, I'd still prefer to have a job rather than be one, and the thought of a son was only slightly more enticing than a daughter who's with a son. I'd only have to worry about one penis, and that's only if he's straight, and that's only if he identifies as he. Now, for those of you who may be concerned, I didn't have any kids, wasn't expecting them anytime soon, but sometimes I would envision their rooms in my head of tucking them into bed and singing them to sleep like my father did for me, passing on the lessons that I learned from him that anger will make you strong. But love will make you powerful. That family is the foundation on which all strong homes are built and that wilting beneath the weight of your tear ducts is the true measure of a good man. So don't spend the saline solution frivolously not when it can sterilize a tattered spirit for it to begin the healing process and that your name means something, that your imagination is the strongest weapon and greatest toy you will ever possess and that it's one of a kind. In a technological age where there's a perfectly logical explanation for everything, I will teach them to dream. For what destitute times we must be living in when children are so world weary, they cannot even believe in magic. I will teach them to make lightning dance beneath their fingertips, to sing with sea creatures and call the many winds by their first names, that there are many shades of good and evil, but you gotta be one of the good guys 
There are so many of the bad ones running loose. And when I'm shaken loose from this mortal coil, be brief in your mourning. I will be in the rise and fall of your chest as you breathe in the sunrise. I will be the eyes looking back at you from the mirror and always remember that daddy loves you. And if anybody's ever stupid enough to ask, is your father dead? You hold your head up high and you say, no, he isn't. Because he lives in me. I don't have any kids. I wasn't expecting them anytime soon, but I am excited to teach them. Next, we have Dr. William Pewitt, who's going to do a presentation on at-will employees. Now I can speak, and you can hear me better. That may not be an improvement. <laughs> so, um, so in the back, I was just saying, we have the flyer for our class uh, schedule, non-credit schedule. Uh, we're in the process of trying to develop a credit uh, degree program, and we hope more will uh, be coming out on that later on, where you can get a degree in labor studies. But right now, we offer these non-credit programs, and they're all online. So you don't have to you know, wend your way out in the worst possible traffic uh, on the planet uh, in order to get to Cap uh, at that time period. So, but you know, please uh, feel free to take a flyer and we hope to see some of you enroll in our classes. Uh, a lot of different variety there. And then the second thing is there's another handout there that some of you have heard a little bit about already, about the uh, Aquan uh, McElrath documentary project. So uh, hopefully all of you have heard one way or another about uh, this woman who I always used to introduce when I had an opportunity to do so, uh, her as the Hawaii's Mother Jones. <laughs> Uh, she, and if you know the history of Mother Jones, you know that she was a union person uh, you know, from beginning to end. That's her primary thing. Uh, she went to jail, I think, for the last time at, what, age 80-something or other. And uh, uh, she uh, is an amazing person nationally, Mother Jones. And AQ is really about the closest thing we'll ever have to somebody who had that role and had that respect. Uh, and also who had that fearless determination to confront uh, people who were trying to suppress labor. Uh, and uh, I think her life story needs to be told. In fact, what we're going to do, and that's why before I do my little shot, uh, is we have a short video clip, if you haven't seen this, to sort of give you a taste of what we're doing. Uh, and I promise it won't be the whole program. It'll be a short piece. Uh, and I'm hoping that it will play uh, correctly and we won't have any technical problems. But uh, stand back. have allowed the rampagings of a political economic system that does not care for people who sit in this room. And what does this mean? This means that each one of us, each one of us individually and in groups must pressure Congress, must pressure the new president and say, we will not take this. And each one of us must be educated to the point where we feel we do have the answers to a political economic system that dares to discriminate against all of us. Those American organizers of unions who believed that there is a different way of living. Certainly for those who live in our nation who are so exploited by the present situation 
they should feel or they should know that these individuals truly believe that there was a different way of ordering the economic system which would make for better happiness, for better realization of one's self, and, and for those of us who live in the future, the lesson should not be lost that there are different ways of organizing an economic system, that these individuals did not live their lives in vain. We used to have speeches in Ilocano, in Visayan, in Japanese, in pure English, and in Pidgin English. That was so that everybody would understand exactly what was going on and could say what he wanted to say. It is the awakening, as it were, of all of the workers' feelings about themselves, their families, their jobs. And to me, this is the story of the awakening of the human spirit through a group called a union. But it was through the ILWU that we brought to the political scene a large percentage of workers and tried to increase their understanding as to why it was important for them to participate in the electoral process. What we are getting into presents a whole new bunch of challenges. And I would hope that as the leadership of trade unions change, made up of this group of young people who have gone through these massive changes, that in fact they will be able to alter their strategy and tactics so far as organizing is concerned. But it's going to be a toughie. We have been so touched by the feeling that individually we count for something, that we have forgotten we live in a family of individuals. And there is absolutely no way in which there can be any improvement made in our lives until everyone in this room will go on out and recruit another person so that, in fact, that which promoted the labor movement years ago with the dream of a world with peace, a world without war, will not occur unless we go on out and act to work with one other person and say, will you work with me? Okay, well, again, thank you for uh, uh, being so attentive and patiently listening to our little clip, six minutes worth of uh, what the directions were going on to tell the story of AQ. And uh, again, she's more than anything else, uh, she was the union organizer. And uh, uh, the position she held uh, at ILWU was a social worker. And it's pretty rare that a union you know, particularly that far back, hired a social worker, but she was so much more than that term might otherwise imply. Uh, she ended up being one of the most significant lobbyists, uh, uh, you know, for a huge number of liberal causes, uh, which were all, as far as she was concerned, union causes, all right? Uh, I think that a lot of people would say, uh, not just AQ, but uh, the consortium of people that she organized as well around her uh, were responsible for our family leave law and, uh, uh, and many others that we just sort of take for granted today. So her story is a magnificent story. Uh, she was born in abject poverty and she was incredibly brilliant. Uh, from the very first time she attended elementary school, I think teachers understood this was an amazing mind. Uh, and uh, she used it 
in uh, the most, uh, I think, magnificent of all ways, and that is to help other people and to help organize. Uh, I know uh, earlier uh, one of our poets talked about a job isn't something that you are, except an organizer. <laughs> I tend to think if you're gonna be anything, right? Uh, not question of you know, being a social worker or being a union agent or being a steward, be an organizer. Everything you do can be that, and you will have lived a good life. Uh, so uh, I, I hope that uh, her example will be uh, inspiration uh, to a, a whole new generation. And uh, that's why we really want you to know about AQ. So and I shouldn't be saying all that with my name in the background. That was not my intention. <laughs> so, so, but nevertheless, that's me. Uh, so we have a, a, a website. I hope you will feel free to visit our website. Uh, that's the URL up there. So now it's uh, westoahu.hawaii.edu slash clear. And uh, we have a lot of material up there on labor law as well as labor history. So you know, please feel free. You know, some of our more uh, uh, popular uh, Rice and Roses programs, like the one we're trying to work on now for AQ, uh, are in streaming video, and it's our hope in the future to be put, able to put more and more of them up uh, as we try to get the, them digitized through the uh, Ulu Ulu archive. Uh, and uh, uh, we actually are the largest part of their collection, if, from what I understand at this stage of the game. So uh, that's our website. Feel free to. Uh, bookmark that and pass it around. We like to see people go there. And of course, our current class schedule will always be available there also. Okay, <laughs> so much for uh, my advertisement. And moving right along here. So I have to talk about, uh, I've been invited to talk about at-will employment and keep it brief. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that possible for me to do that on any topic? I'm going to endeavor. I'm looking at the clock now, and I, all right. Uh, so this has to do with uh, really about collective bargaining, to understand that. And I, uh, not infrequently, I'm asked to talk to people about you know, what a union is all about. And so that's what some of these things are. And of course, collective bargaining, uh, as opposed to individual bargaining, you know, is what uh, the union movement is all about. It's not about the individual, it's about the union, right? And I think that's some of the hardest things for people nowadays to swallow, but you're looking at a contract, a union contract, and the reason is that you're more likely to have rights if you together are able to get a contract. And getting a contract as a group which we call a union, is 100%, believe it or not, as hard as it is, easier you know, and more likely to be successful than just going in on your own. Unless you happen to be some kind of superstar, uh, you know, whatever. And that's, you know, yeah, those people will never have a problem you know, negotiating their things. Uh, I've never been on that list, so, so I, uh, but, you know, I, I read about them. And, you know, more power to them, I guess. But the rest of us, you know, uh, schmucks, we have to, the best we're going to be able to do is by working together and, and having a union to bargain collectively. Right? And it, it offends some people, but too bad. These are the only way you're going to be able to get these kind of benefits. These are the things that people negotiate into collective bargaining agreements. Right? What are unions formed for? To get respect on the job, better wages, more flexibility, counterbalance to the unchecked power of employers, and a voice in improving the quality and services. Yeah, all of these things are true, but the topic tonight is even more so uh, an issue. I often put this question to uh, groups that I'm working with or teaching, and I say the main reason that workers organize labor unions, and this is actually documented by true research, <laughs> right, above and beyond mine at a national level. There have been tons of surveys about why do people form and join unions? What, is, what are the number one reasons? And you can understand how an organizer would find that useful information, <laughs> right? So, all right, and if you look at that list, a lot of people who really don't know any better are going to start by saying, no, the wages. It's all about getting better wages, right? And working conditions. But do you know what consistently the number one is from that list? to protect themselves from arbitrary and capricious termination, D. Very good, that's exactly it. 
And, you know, it's kind of amazing when you think about this. I still, you know, remember working with the union in town that, you know, uh, that was it. That, they came because they'd suddenly been threatened and, you know, made, laid out in front of them exactly what they are. And they were made to sign statements that they are at-will employees and recognize that because probably their employer went to a seminar taught by, you know, uh, a local employer group that said, oh, you should have all of your employees acknowledge and uh, sign off right now that they are at-will employees and they can be terminated at any reason and, you know, for no reason or at any time and for no reason. At-will employment, all right? Um, and it's a unique feature uh, in the United States, all right? I've had the good fortune sometimes to be able to lecture in other countries, and when I try to explain this to them, they are aghast, literally. You know, like, are you out of, uh, what on earth? Why would anybody put up with that? That's awful, all right? But, you know, it is a unique feature in the United States, all right? Uh, and I, I will say this, you know, historically, one of the reasons it came to pass is because of uh, the Civil War and the tradition of slavery in the United States. Because for many, many years, until the Civil War, the relationship of what we would say an employer to an employee was governed by a law that was very popularly passed and adopted all over the place. It was actually originally uh, based on English law, English law, and it was called the Masters and Servants Law. And so, in other words, there wasn't an employment law. The term employment was just simply not used. It was masters and servants. The only way two people who were in a relationship that we would today call an employment relationship was that one of them was a master and the other was a servant. And the word servant meant slave. There's just those two things, all right? And all those masters and servants law, including the one that they passed in Hawaii in 1850, to accommodate the immigration, right, was covered two, they had two sections. One was a section for apprentices. I always like to bring this out to the construction guys, okay, and, and, and ladies, because apprenticeship was one of the first things that was covered in like this early form of employment law, masters and servants. So, you know, part one, apprentices. And part two, slaves and indentured. <laughs> And so, you know, now not all slaves meant people who were captured in, you know, from Africa. The, you could be indentured. You, know, you could be just so poor that the only way you could survive was to surrender yourself to the system. But the control of the employer over you at that time period was that of a, of a you were the slave and they were the master. They didn't say employer, employee. Right? So even today, a lot of wage and hour law is based on that uh, uh, determining whether or not there is a master-servant relationship, as the attorneys like to say, or the courts like to figure out. So that's a, that's a, a legacy in the United States. Now, when slavery was made illegal you know, and unconstitutional uh, after the Civil War, then the big question came out, well, then what is the relationship of people who have all these workers? Right? And so this is a common law doctrine. There is no statute. The default is if it's true that you're not a slave, you can leave all right, at any time, but the employer can get rid of you, terminate you at any time. All right? And so that's what's called at will. The relationship is at will because slavery has been abolished in the United States. And therefore, you want to quit, you can quit. There's nothing binding you, all right? But they can fire you. There's nothing binding them. So that at will thing goes back to that tradition of slavery, all right? Uh, it's an interesting term. I found out it's actually a Latin phrase for it, ad, uh, ad arbitrium. Okay, and uh, it, it goes back to the usage during uh, the Middle Ages of uh, any, anybody who was in control of somebody else, including parents, that they, they, they had control over you at their pleasure, ad arbitrium, right? And they could do anything they want to you, such as the Romans used to do. You could murder your children, that would be okay, because after all, you made them. And uh, so you can always make some more. Right? Uh, my dad used to say that to me. I don't know if he was kidding. I hope, you know, but <laughs> there it is. Okay. So 
this question then comes about today, which is what most people are, you know, I get asked this actually quite a great deal of the time. Does an employer have a legal right to fire an employee for no reason? I was just fired for no reason. That's got to be illegal. Somebody said I should go to the labor board. Okay, yeah, good one, right? Because A, there is no such thing as the labor board <laughs> that deals with this, all right? So uh, there's a bunch of labor boards and they deal with all kinds of different topics. There is no unified uh, place you go. And so, but in any event, what is the answer to this, okay? And the answer is, yeah, they have a legal right to fire you for no reason whatsoever. That's at will employment. Right? Now, many people who have lived and worked in the union environment from early on have, don't even realize this. They just assumed that this is a legal right. They are living, you know, naively in, uh, and then they think, so, you know, it couldn't be a big deal to lose it. <laughs> but uh, I, I have some good friends who moved from being a union job to a non-union job, and they actually called me and says, oh my God, <laughs> you know. They just made it sure I understood I'm an at-will employee. And so uh, common law doctrine in the United States without a contract or a specific statutory provision to the contrary, at any time and for any reason, either the employer or the employee can terminate the employment relationship. All right, so the big deals there, are contract stops at. If you have a contract, you're not an at-will employee anymore, you go by the contract. Contract supersedes. This is a common law doctrine, which is, means like a safety net. It's you know, how the courts are going to look at this otherwise. And since the 60s, we've started to see passage of things like the civil rights law and OSHA that have embedded within them specific reasons that you may not fire or terminate somebody. So you cannot fire somebody because of their race, right, or their color or their age, you know, or their now disability and a whole bunch of other cool things. But short of that, they can fire you for nothing, right? So yeah, if the employer is stupid enough to say, yes, I'm firing you because you know, you're Asian. Well, good, you've got a case, you can take them to not the labor board, but the EEOC or the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. There's a special board for every different thing that the employer can do wrong. <laughs> All right, I, I thought this is insane, but there it is. It's how we organize things in the US. Uh, the full employment job, uh, you know, uh, law for attorneys <laughs> uh, more than anything else. But there is no single labor board that should be able to handle all of the issues no matter what they are. But uh, that's Pewitt just thinking crazy again. And uh, so, <laughs> Common law doctrine, you know, yeah, if they violate, if they fire you for a specific reason that by the statute is made illegal, okay, then uh, you have a claim. But I've been to actually sitting back as a mole, uh, presentations done by employers groups where their attorneys say, whatever you do, don't give a reason. <laughs> because you give a reason and you open the door. So you have an absolute right to fire somebody for no reason. <laughs> That's at will employment, all right? But once you start giving a reason, you could, you know, some clever attorney representing that person could find a way to, you know, uh, squeeze that or wiggle that into some other statute that specifically says don't do that, okay? So, yeah. What does it mean then? Simply stated, if there's no labor contract, you have no job security, and there's no reason needed to be given for termination. People who do not have contracts and mostly that's non-union non -union people. Without a union contract, you can be fired for no reason, right? And that is the key. It's the number one benefit that a lot of people don't realize they have who are members of unions, and they only miss it when, you know, like a lot of things, uh, it's not there when you need it, okay? In every, and then, in, so what is it? You do this, you enforce this in a contract by a grievance. And, and the cool thing about uh, a grievance procedure in almost every labor contract is it requires the employer to have cause. What a novel idea, that they should have a reason. <laughs> and they should be required to have a reason. It has to be a just reason or just cause for firing somebody. You know, not like the famous Trump television program, <laughs> The Apprentice, where you just love to be able to fire people for no reason. You know, his idea of proper employment relationship is exactly that. You know, it's not the Dagwood Bumstead and Mr. Dithers 
thing. They can fire somebody, uh, you know, kicking them in the butt, you know, out of the cartoon frame. So, but that's what a lot of Americans think it uh, should be. If I have an employee, I should be able to fire him at any moment uh, for no reason in particular. And it's an awful precept. And it's unique to the United States, which is another sad aspect of it. Uh, in most other countries, that's not the case. In, uh, in, in, if you have a contract, you can file a grievance. And the other interesting thing about this is such a grievance switches the burden of proof from the employee. So if you are going to say, they fired me because of my race, you have to prove they fired you because of your race. The burden is on you, the claimant. Right? But in a union contract, if it says they have to have just cause, the employer has to prove that they have just cause. And every person, you know, otherwise is presumed innocent. The presumption of innocence is on the employee who's being accused of a terminable offense. Right? And that is way better and much more protection than otherwise. Right? Some, and there are a lot of employers, that's the one reason, the major reason they hate unions <laughs> in talking to a lot of employers is they want this power. They don't want to give this ability to fire somebody for no reason. And I say, you can still fire them if they do something wrong and you have proof. Well, I don't want to have to bother about that. <laughs> you know, I, I want to fire them just because I want to, <laughs> not because I have just cause. <laughs> so, bad joke, sorry, okay. <laughs> I didn't make it up, but... I shouldn't have repeated it. In all but disciplinary grievances, the union bears the burden of proof, but in a disciplinary grievance, because the employer is making the accusation, then the person who is accused is presumed innocent, and the employer has to present evidence. evidence. Just cause requirement in a labor agreement means that covered employees are no longer at will. No longer at will. All right? And I've actually seen situations where some of the unionized employers went to those same employment seminars and they started circulating a statement around asking all the unionized employees to sign a, uh, a statement that they are at-will employees because they were stupid enough to think that they could do that uh, uh, and follow that advice. That is actually most illegal. It's not just grievable. It is an attempt to do uh, you know, direct uh, dealing and that's uh, an unfair labor practice clearly under the statute. Okay, so um, employees are presumed innocent, employer must prove guilt. So I'm gonna end with these couple fast questions. I'm gonna do this in the time that I was given. Does the employer have a legal right to fire somebody who is smoking off duty at home? Just legal right. And I always say, without a union, let's, put, let's take off that, okay? Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And by the way, these are actual real cases, <laughs> all right? So the employer decided they were gonna have a health care premium that if they guaranteed to the provider that all of their workers are non-smokers. So they fired a guy when they saw him smoking in another context. Actually, he was at a football game and the, the camera went over him and he had a big cigar and that was, uh, it was his last day at, <laughs> as an employee. So, okay, you think off duty at home, hey, how can they do that? You know, they can't, you know, well, they can. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there. All right. Does the employer have a legal right to fire somebody who is supporting legislation the employer opposes? Yes. 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 You go, wait a minute, this is America. <laughs> no, I always tell people, America, you know, America, you leave America when you go to work, you're now in employer land. <laughs> and, you know, now, the, the only difference is if you're a government worker, okay, yeah, you, can, you know, government workers are still presumably the action would be from government and they would have some protection there. But other than that, they can, yeah, they see a, a, a bumper sticker supporting a candidate that they are opposed to uh, and you, you'll be fired. And that's something they have an absolute right to do. It, is it just? No. <laughs> All right, it's certainly not just cause, <laughs> but there it is, okay? Does the employer have a legal right to fire someone who refuses to work overtime because of a child care responsibility? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. No protection yet for that, all right? Sadly, all right, sadly, all right? So, does the employer have a legal right to fire someone who reveals serious safety or environmental violations to the media, to the press? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, the answer is yes. And you're thinking, whistleblower, right? What is the definition of a whistleblower? If you reveal them to the proper government agency. 
If you take them to the press, you're out of luck. Okay, so there you go. Does the employer have a legal right to fire somebody who refuses to submit a, to a personal search, including pockets or purse, yes. while they're at work? Yes, they do. And again, government might, you know, there's been some serious interesting cases about unreasonable search and seizure for government workers, which by the way, haven't all come out like you might think. <laughs> so, but there it is, all right? Yeah, all right. Anything you have at work is open to the employer's inspection. And if you, this also applies if you park in their parking lot. All right? So, yeah, you have, you have no rights when it comes to, you know, you're in employer land. You're not, you know, all the restrictions you think, most of them are government can't do this. Right? Constitutional protections, not your employer. Does the employer have a legal right to fire someone who refuses to take a psychological test with questions about their sex life and toilet habits? <laughs> yes, and this is the Coors beer case. Okay, that's what they used to do. Now, I understand, hopefully, they have stopped doing that, but they were fighting unions big time. And they also were very strongly opposed to any po you know, anybody who was uh, remotely uh, you know, uh, having a, a gender uh, or, or sexual orientation issue. <laughs> and so they had a whole bunch of uh, experts com compose questions to suggest that you might have such uh, an identity issue, and then you would be fired immediately. They were very strong, religiously committed to straight, and that's it. And so, uh, we had the organizer over here one time, I still remember, who was telling me about, here's the, look at this, look at these questions. And uh, I was kind of disappointed because we couldn't get anybody to boycott Coors Beer. All right, uh, at the, because you know that and spam, by the way, which is the Hormel was doing almost the same thing. So, and, you know, but trying to get people not to eat spam in Hawaii or drink Coors beer, I was fighting against the tide. <laughs> you know, uh, so there it was. Okay, but you know, awful, absolutely evil. You know, stuff that was going on, and you know, most people, eh, you know, so what? That's why we shop at Walmart, right? Uh, don't get me started. Does the employer have a legal right to fire someone who has reported a workplace hazard to OSHA or HIOSH? At last I can say no, <laughs> all right? Because that law specifically has a protection for people who report workplace safety violations to them. And you know, it's, that's something that is under HRS 396 uh, section eight. <laughs> there is a very, very specific prohibition against uh, any employment decision, which is based on, uh, and not only for reporting, but also for refusing work, which is unsafe, particularly if it uh, uh, has to do with unsafe work which, for which there's already a regulation uh, uh, under OSHA. Uh, and so, uh, so you should, there's at least, at least that protection. But going to the news media with it, pfft, <laughs> you know, that's not the place to go. I'm sorry, you know, not for this kind of protection unless you're prepared to just kiss off your job immediately. So I want to thank you for the time that you have afforded me to talk to you about at-will employment. Thank you. But understand, this is a huge benefit of being in a union. And, and so many people only realize how huge it is when they have let it go. You know, uh, so I think we need to know about this and remind people in today's environment more than anything else. And with that, thank you again. I love those PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> um, okay, so next we're gonna have our two uh, poets come up and do a, another short round, um, and then we'll have Bill Berry. So. My grandfather went to war and back to get off Pepecao plantations. A bullet shattered his cheek and tore out his back, crawled the base until cuticles cracked, sent to military hospital to recover in Germany. Befriended an enemy who became a bedside neighbor and a lifelong correspondence, just the kind of man he was. But not a response from home. His lover kept unopened letters stashed away. She didn't want him to leave. So instead of grief, she lay, left the letter sealed in a corner, like her heart tucked in a chest. Hedman Canberra loved to learn.
But on Pepekeo plantations, goals don't stretch past the next harvest. Dreams are the hardest because Icarus views the plantation stores and fields causes the wax to wake. Before morning sneaks through window panes. Morning the morning again. Edmund was offered an education in town, off the plantation. But his father rejected the jester. Couldn't let one of his sons run off and learn. Fields need to be turned, teenage muscles burn, and Sugarcane learns to fight back with every machete hat slashing across where paper cuts could be. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, recruiters came to camp, and Edmund was one of the few who could sign more than just an X. On a German pasture, just like any other, my grandfather learned that scouts and snipers don't mix, and he was left for dead. Only him and God knew different. There is no confessional quite like a quiet foxhole. Scenic fields feel different, crawling on your belly, afraid of yelling in pain or for help. My grandpa's hardest footsteps are marked with bloody palm prints and fingernails impaled and every next step dug in the soul. But there was a woman at home, and sometimes that's enough. Purple hearted until he headed home and made my father and gave him two brothers. See, my father was born plantation poor, where he needed to hustle for newspapers if you wanted to teach yourself to read where your daily chores cause you to bleed, where you could have everything you could want and not enough of what you need. This is where my family tree sprouted its seeds. My grandfather killed grandfathers to see farther than the plantation. And I'm sure in his nightly conversations with God, he promised to never put his future generations in similar situations determined to provide his offspring the opportunity through education. So Ronald, my father, went further than island dreams, a local boy pursuing goals over an ocean, hoping to open the doors locked to his dad. Being the first camper etched on a Hilo certificate was not enough. So Grandpa said, what's next? And he was deployed to UH Manoa. And after the flashes, decorative sashes, Edmund stashes that degree to be hung and displayed and said, what's next? So in Washington, he became a doctor of communication and education, came back home and made a family. And kicking and screaming, I'm following my parents' footsteps, but in my own path. Part special needs, part higher education, part classroom, part administration, with no union for a poet's, uh, no union for a poet mentor. So I fly without a net, earn student respect, part for what I'm teaching, part for making it poetic, and entirely because I give that back. And now I'm proud of what I do. I help teens through hard times, through raw rhymes and free rights. But if you were to tell the teenager in me that I would grow to be a teacher, the class clown in me would have thrown something at you. The jock in me would have given you a wedgie and the poet in me would have said nothing. Because at 17, I did not believe that there was a future for my feelings, did not believe that poetry could provide like a jump shot. But in basketball, you only need one bad fall to end it all. But in poetry, bad falls make for more poetry. So I've got a litany of potential literature. But what I've really learned, doing what you love is more important than doing what you're told, but if you're gonna break molds and rules, you need the tools to build a brighter tomorrow. So I use poetry to reach a generation with failed education, but a passion to learn. And when it's their turn, take the bridges we've burnt and build from the ashes, wish on eyelashes, equality becomes our equation. We leave no child left behind, stuck on plantations. So uh, I feel like uh, seeking, obtaining, and maintaining union membership is an act of self-preservation, right? We've just talked about how at-will employment, how quickly and capriciously they can cut off our ability to, to make a living. Um, and so this, this one that I'm about to do, uh, it was also an actual conversation of people talking about life expectancies uh, at the airport, my first travel gig a long time ago. Um, and they gave a very weird response when I asked about my department. Uh, they, were, they were like, uh, sorry, you're replaceable. You know what I mean? You're expendable. And I, so I went home and I screamed at a piece of paper, and this is what came out. This is called uh, Don't Be a Hero. They say the average life expectancy of a first assistant director is 54 years old, but grips are expendable. You are a hammer. A tool to be wielded by hands that haven't seen a callus in years. We break and are replaced. Don't be a hero, they tell me. 
Don't wander off the beaten path. The one that's taken is suicide. Just stay in line. Don't mess around. Don't waste my time. We are working. Keep your head down and your mouth shut. You might even get paid. Don't be a hero. Call this blade of grass gets cut down first. Do not disobey. Initiative should not be taken. It is not encouraged. Just get some brown on your nose and move slowly. We don't need heroes. Not the knight in shining armor, not the song by Bonnie Tyler, not the TV series. Heroes are a myth. They don't exist. Just do your job. Obey commands. Hurry up and wait. Get down on all fours. We will tell you when to breathe. This, from friends with good intentions, is the hardest jagged suppository to swallow. That doing anything inventive is liable to get you fired. That offering creative solutions is a serious problem. That the shadow I tried to leave behind by feeding my mind is breathing down my neck. My employers want an animal. Someone who can bend light and move mountains. I'm not going to lie. I want my Conan moment. I want to rip the horn off an evil god and shove a blade between his eyes. I want to lop the head of a sorceress and rolling to his followers. I want the ball, coach. Games on the line, no time left. I want it, but not at the cost of my body and soul. I am told that the film industry will chew me up and spit me out. I'm half-cooked chicken. Equipped with the corn starch to make the gravy thick, and I'm also proactive like a lion in a china shop. Because after the bull's done breaking everything, it won't eat all the customers. I always forget to remember to be afraid of the consequences. But whether you're a production assistant or executive producer, if you're an earshot, you are catching some of this enfilade. I broke out of my cage ages ago, and so long as there is breath in my veins, I will not be sent back to that school of thought, nor its barred windows. The world needs heroes. Not the knight in shining armor, not the song by Bonnie Tyler, and not the TV series. We need teachers, coaches, mentors, activists, artists, because without this thing, the sharing of one so that others may have, the world becomes bleak and desolate without the laughter of youth. The giggles at their own experiments come to life of success on the clock through alternative means of unconventional thinking being the sharp key necessary to be in tune with the solution. Without that, the silence is deafening. I want to be a hero. I want to heal my people from a crippling methamphetamine epidemic. I want to shape the mind of the first native Hawaiian president. I want to bring sustainability before I bring sovereignty, even if it kills me, I choose to be a hero. It's the only thing necessary for the forces of evil to conquer the world is for a few good people to do nothing. Let's give him another round of applause. Okay, and now we've got more excellent stuff from Bill Barry. Well, those are very tough acts to follow. And uh, so if you want to get up and walk out, uh, go ahead. I won't feel hurt at all. You know, when Bill was talking about at-will employees, you read today's paper and you realize how privileged we are as union members to have it. So two examples, one of them in South Carolina Workers who have evacuated because of the hurricane are now being threatened with the loss of their jobs because they need to come back. And so the risk of their family, the risk of their lives is nothing for the profit of their boss. The second thing, unfortunately, near to my home in Baltimore, Maryland, was a workplace shooting. Three people were killed at a non-union Rite Aid warehouse. And the conditions in non-union workplaces bring that tension that gets people to do horrible things. And that's why it's so important, this whole question about Janus. Since I don't know you, I don't know how many of you know about Janus or what you know, so let me do a little background. Public sector in 22 states, and what you all do know as union members, is that it takes money to keep your union going. And so the Janus case attacked that revenue stream. Um, in 22 states, unions were able to negotiate what's called an agency fee. 
And an agency fee means if you have someone like Michael Janis, who worked for the uh, State of Illinois Child Welfare Board, um, I call him J. Uh, <laughs> as uh, more appropriate. Um, I also refer to him in the book as uh, Michael Judas, because two weeks after this case was decided, he quit his job with the state of Illinois and went to work at double the salary or more for an anti-union right-wing foundation. So, yeah, exactly, boo. And so these are not people of principle. But the negotiation, the legislation of the enactment of an agency fee means in a state like Maryland or in a state like Hawaii, a union can negotiate an agency fee and so that a person covered by the contract who doesn't want to become a member of the union has to pay to the union. And the argument is what? They get all the benefits of the union. Why shouldn't they help financially support it? The union has to represent them if they have a problem. And this has become a challenge in the last two months for all union stewards. Uh, Randy here is a member of the Masters, Mates, and Pilots. I did a program at their convention a month or so ago, and I was talking to one of his stewards, an old-time union guy who's a, a, a captain on the Staten Island Ferry. And his solution to this was, F the free riders. Only he didn't use the deletion. And the argument was, if they're not paying, we won't represent them. Bad idea. Because all of you who are union stewards know that when you file a grievance, you're not representing an individual, you're defending the contract and defending the union. And one of the things that happens, and employers are smart, they will study this stuff and they will decide, here's something we want to do. Here's a just cause that we want to get away from. And so what we'll do, we'll do it to a non-member. And let's see if the union defends him. And if the union doesn't defend him, the next time they do it to a member, they can say, well, it's past practice. You didn't grieve it the first time. It must have been OK, and so you can't do it now. So it's only fair that agency fee payments are, are required of people. They get all the benefits of the contract. The union has to represent them. Why shouldn't they contribute? That legislation is now no longer available. It's outlawed. Five men in Washington who've never worked a day in their life, if I can see that, um, ruled against it. It's estimated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics this is about 10,000 people in Hawaii alone are agency fee payers. That revenue is going to be lost to all the public sector unions. As I said, we're going to have this challenge of whether to represent them or not. More importantly, the decision in Janus represents a real challenge to our union movement and a sign of the weakness that we have seen for the past 70 years. Because in 1977, an identical case was brought in the city of Detroit by a man named Abood who challenged the agency fee. And if you want to, this uh, book here, I know you've all read it since we've been sitting here. Instead of listening to the poets and Bill and stuff like that, you've been reading the book. So I assume that uh, you're talking about it. But the Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell, who's one of the most anti-union people in American history, wrote a decision blocking any challenge to agency fee. And the reason he did it, he says, because we want to preserve labor peace. Because if unions have to compete for members, they're going to cause trouble, and we don't want that. Now unions are so weak that they don't give a They don't figure that we can cause enough trouble to get in there and break them. Another sign of it is in all these Supreme Court cases, uh, of hearings of, uh, just, of Mr. Kavanaugh, we have all these arguments about women and previous attitudes. Not a single question, to my knowledge, was asked to him about the Janus decision. And he would be a crucial vote. 
Some of you who have followed this remember three years ago, um, in January of 2016, two and a half years ago, a case, a similar case, identical case, was headed to the Supreme Court. A woman named Rebecca Friedrichs from California had sued her union, the California teachers, to get away from paying. She claimed it was a violation of her First Amendment rights. How paying taxes is a violation of my First Amendment rights is something I wanted to ask the governor of Hawaii about when he was speaking at the ILWU convention. So if I don't like a policy that the President of the United States does, I can then say First Amendment rights says I don't have to pay for it. Um, that's a really unique argument. I'll be glad to see how Donald Trump would respond to something like that. Rebecca Friedrich's case was headed to the Supreme Court, it was going to pass, and Justice Scalia died. Yes. <laughs> not, a, not a heartbreak, uh, not a tear in this household, anyhow. And what it did, and a woman, when I did a presentation up in Minnesota, right after his death, the weekend after his death, said, don't be fooled. We didn't get a pardon. Uh, we got a par uh, didn't get a pardon. We got a parole, meaning they're going to come back. And if you look at the book I did here, it tries to show you how the brothers and these right-wing foundations are relentless. They've been coming after Union Security since 1947. They came after it with the Taft-Hartley Act in the private sector, which allowed states to create an open shop state. And I never use the term right to work because there's plenty of unemployment in these open shop states. And if it was a right to work state, then everybody would have a job, right? The decline of the union movement is marked by that because in 1947, when the law passed, there were no open shop states, and today there's 27 of them. Now, I ask every union member out here, is that the direction we want to go? And the answer is no. So we've got to turn this thing around. We are against a very smart, well-funded anti-union opposition, which is not going to be satisfied until all of us in this room are gone, until there is no union left in this country, when everybody is an at-will employee. On the planet, that's correct. I stand corrected. Thank you. Because certainly you can see it in Europe, you see it in England, you can see it in France, where the railroad strikes. Um, you see people like Viktor Orban in Hungary. It's, it's a national, a global conspiracy. That's one of the things that we have found in the private sector that changes. Because we're now dealing with global employers. I remember in negotiations many years ago, sitting face-to-face -face in negotiations with the owner of the factory. You know who was making decisions, you know where they lived, you know what they wanted. Now, you're dealing with these investment companies and their global investors and all kinds of other real uh, difficult situations. So we've got to change everything that we do. And I talk about it in some of the books. I'm not allowed to talk about them because on TV it sounds like a commercial pitch. You've got the ads for them. How we do grievances how we do contract negotiations, how we do political action, how we do organizing. Everything we do has to be directed at how do we get non-members and non-union supporters to join us and be part of it. And if you look at the back, page 27 of your book, you're going to see two models of unionism. And one of them is the organizing model, and one of them is the servicing model. And the difficulty is that most unions, everybody got that? One of the problems is that most unions operate on a servicing model basis. That is, a few people make all the decisions and everybody else stays home. And in many cases, the people at the top like it that way because they have a full-time union job, their salaries are good, and they don't want people coming in and stirring everybody up. And so this is what we have to do. We have to change. One of the areas in which we have to change in a question of how do you gain loyalty of our members, our co-workers, to the union. And one of my arguments is that over the past 70, 80 years, we've become addicts. We've become addicted. And the bosses are our suppliers. And there are three ways in which we have become addicted. One of them is by contract clauses, the union shop. 
When I say the union shop contract clause, what do I mean? All you IBEW guys out there, what does that mean? Nobody, okay. It means that there is a section of the contract that says anybody working here must become a member of the union and remain a member of the union. So you negotiate with the boss to get language in the contract that requires everybody who comes to work there to be part of the union. Um, the second part of the addiction is the checkoff. And what is the checkoff? The checkoff is you sign some form and money is automatically taken out of your check and sent to the union. And both these become a dependency. So when the union shop is gone, many unions don't know how to function. When the checkoff is taken away, and if you're in negotiations, one of the things he's nodding his head, you've been in negotiations where the employer said, okay, you let the contract expire, no more checkoff, right? And we get caught as a union in that. I remember when I was a member of the union, my first union, the Carpenters Local, there was no checkoff, there was no union security. You were in it because you wanted to be in it. We had membership meetings twice a month on Friday. Financial secretary would set up a table outside half an hour before the meeting started, and you'd come and you'd pay your dues. There was no checkoff. There was no union security agreement. But when you walked on a job, the first thing the union steward said is what? Let me see your book. And if your book was not paid up, you didn't work. And this is a tradition that goes back hundreds of years. We didn't need the employer to help us do this, to make the union strong. And the danger is when we get dependent on the employer, they don't do it for free. They want a six page management rights clause. They want a law that says the union can't bargain over decisions. For example, if we're thinking about closing or moving or something like that, you can bargain over the effects of it, but you can't bargain over the decision itself, which means that 90% of what happens in our workplace, the union figures, oh, I can't do anything about that. That's the thing that's uh, got to change. So what we've got to do then is rethink the unions in all these different ways and particularly looking at the question of union income. And what you're gonna see on your uh, book, on the last page, or the second to the last page, is an example that I use called the cash value of a union contract. And if you're with a coworker, how many of you in the last week have worked with a coworker who's about union dues. Come on now, come on, be honest. It happens, huh? All the, time. all the time. It happens all the time. And one of the things that you want to do then is to start with this sheet and go through so people can see the cash value of the union contract. It's great to talk about the future of the union, the future of the world, solidarity, all that kinds of stuff. Money in my pocket is one thing that makes me sit up and listen. So what you can do here is you go through, and you don't have to do it now, the cash value of a union contract. Um, this is set up for Maryland. I don't know what the Hawaii minimum wage is. You can adjust that. 1010, 10, okay. But what you, what you have to understand, and what Bill uh, talked about here, the at-will employee, they get two mandated benefits minimum wage, and overtime over 40. And other than that, nothing. Everything else that you get comes because the union negotiated it. And you look through here, your hourly wage, how much it is above 10, 10 an hour. Do you get daily overtime? Over eight, because as soon as you start getting that, the money rolls up. We used to get double time on Saturdays as such. You know, you come in and say, yeah, he's not in your head. This is one of the things the billing trades has lost over time. Um, so those are all benefits that the union get. If you get a shift differential, if you get a pension, if you get health and welfare payments, all of that is money that the union has negotiated. It's money in your pocket. And so if somebody's complaining about dues, have them fill this out. 
We were doing, uh, I did some uh, training for the ILWU Local 142 convention over there. Their dues are two and a half percent. So what I said to them is somebody's on the job complaining, go to them and say, look, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna give you a hundred dollars. Would you give me 250? They said, well, sure. Well, if I give you another hundred dollars, would you give me another 250? Well, yeah, right? That's union dues. That's at two and a half percent. I mean, I used to do it. I used to, when I was a staff rep, you walk in a lunchroom and somebody's complaining about the union dues, I would say to them, fine, I'll pay your dues for you. And reach in my pocket, whatever it was. I said, however, I want you to sign an agreement with me that any benefit that the union negotiated for you now comes to me. <laughs> Ooh, and then there was a stop. Um, and we've also done like a cash value. You can do it for your contract. I, I don't have it, it's not in this book, but I had a lot of locals uh, at the CWA and so when Verizon finished their national contract, we would find people getting monthly raises of $90 to $100 a month for $2.61 dues increase. Now, how many of you would take that? Yeah, all of you, okay. I wanna turn, turn the page because one of the things which is very important of our internal organizing is new hires. And this is a case where a lot of the unions, which have a lot of people um, coming in, pay no attention to new hires. I was talking to one of the guys in the hall here from the IBW, I don't know where he is, but I was saying my first day on a union job, and I'd worked non-union, I was an at-will employee, and believe me, I knew what it was like. So I got on the first union job, I was working this enormous construction project in the middle of winter, Two minutes after I started work, I see this huge shadow looming over me. And this was the winter. The guy had three layers of clothing on, looked like a linebacker. And he said, Are you the new kid on the job? And I about peed my pants. I thought, oh, I, I am. He said, well, I'm Dick Matthews. I'm your union steward. Anybody with you, come get me. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. And I had never forgotten that as a new hire. I was also talking to the guy here. When we went to night school, our night school instructor had been a man, worked outside, had quit, gone to work at the vocational school, became the president of the teachers union of all things. This guy was a union a thousand percent. And so when we were learning how to frame roofs and cut stairs, we were also learning about the union. And so one of the programs that I really emphasize, and certainly to the ILWU, is that the first minute anybody is on the time clock, you've got to start talking to them about the union. Not about collecting dues, but about the benefits. And you can do this here, and this was a program, um, excuse me, a, an outline we did for an uh, amalgamated transit union down in uh, Palm Beach, Florida because we got the discussion, and you can do it. You can take your contract and figure it out. But this was, looks at when benefits become available for new hires. It looks, first of all, at all of the things that they are immediately covered by. And one of the problems with a lot of unions is they think, well, I can't arbitrate the discharge of a probationary employee, and, there I can't, and therefore, quote, I can't, the union can't do anything for them. That is bull. You do a huge amount. You can represent them, people who are harassed, who are threatened, all the kinds of stuff that Bill talked about in here as at-will employees. A steward can step up and do it. Plus, these people start getting raises. Plus, they start getting health insurance. And if you work a non-union job today, you're not going to get health insurance. And I speak not as a union member, but as a father, because I know what the workplace is like for young people today. And so you see here what it means as they start accumulating benefits. They start getting sick pay. They start getting health insurance. All that is money that's cash value. So it's really up to us then because what it does, and I use that word loyalty. Loyalty is people who really believe in their organization. And we see it, many of you are members of other organizations, of uh, churches, of fraternal groups, of PTAs. And people volunteer, they give their time, they donate. 
we got to have our unions like that. They're not businesses. It's not a few people making an income and the rest of us paying. It is a movement. And if we don't put it back together, <clears throat> we ain't going to be here. Let me finish up by asking you, how many of you in the last month or so have read a book or an article or seen a video to improve your union skills? Ah, a couple of people. All right, very good. Well, let me suggest to you, if you really want to find an inspirational piece of union skills, and I always say to people, whenever I get discouraged and the union is in tough shape, you know, when people who are religious, they get discouraged, they read the Bible. When I get discouraged, I read labor history. And <laughs> because it shows the sacrifice and the commitment and the imagination and the smarts of people before us. And one of the most inspirational things online is a transcript of a trial from 1805 in Philadelphia. Because people like us getting together collectively wasn't a question of the Janus or the agency fee. We were criminals. And George Pullis and his nine shoemakers were brought into Philadelphia and treated as criminals for organizing union. And fortunately, the man named Thomas Lloyd, who invented stenography, how to do stenography, took a transcript of that trial. And it's online, and you can read it. And the language is a little complicated, but these guys were committed. And the way they did it was, if you were a member of the union, they would help you. They had benefit funds. They paid in dues voluntarily. Um, they even, and here's something you want to take back to your locals, they would find a member who didn't attend a membership meeting. Now, how many of your locals would see a spike in revenue if you put something like that into the Constitution, right? But they also had it, so if you were not a member, they wouldn't sit on the bench with you. They would not work with you, and they would not talk to you, and they would not associate with you in any way. And they were convicted as criminals, and they were fined. And you know what? They left that courtroom and went right back out and kept organizing. And because they did, we are in this room today. And we need to appreciate the people before us. He started talking about planting a tree so that the next generation can sit under the shade. We need to appreciate the generation before us who planted those trees where we're sitting under the shade. In some ways, I think, uh, you know, they talk about our kids as the entitled generation. You know, they think everything should be handed to them. I often think we're that generation because most of us have come into a union which was already existent. We just took those benefits and figured, well, there they were. And so what we've got to do then is renew our commitment to rebuild our unions. We need to talk to all the members on the job, use that cash value, use other material, but make it an effort. Uh, one of the things that we did at the ILWU convention was we created a five and 10 sheet. And I'm old enough, I called it the Woolworth sheet, you know? Uh, but what five things did you learn here? But then what 10 coworkers are you gonna tell about it? And so it took 400 people and we're gonna make them 4,000. And so I urge you tonight to take that commitment to go back on your jobs on Monday and tell people about the need to make the union stronger. Because otherwise, we're not going to be here.